Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, Judge Torella's talk titled Constitutional Rights of U.S. Citizens in America's Colonies. We're very glad to see you here. Uh, on behalf of the International Society, I want to welcome uh, Judge Torella, who's here despite a uh, historic uh, Northeast blizzard. Um, and uh, we want to also thank our main co-sponsor, the Stanford Constitutional Law Center, uh, without whose generous support we wouldn't have been able to, to be here today. And we also want to thank the American Constitution Society and the Stanford Program in Law and Society for their uh, support in promoting this event. And uh, the director, now I'm going to present the director of the Constitutional Law Center, uh, Michael McConnell, who's uh, the Richard, Francis, Richard and Francis Mallory Professor of Law here at Stanford, director of the Constitutional Law Center, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, and a former circuit judge in the, in, the, in the Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, who's going to introduce Judge Torella. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> Thanks. It really is a pleasure for me to be able to welcome our uh, speaker uh, today. As a recovering federal appellate judge, I can tell you that he is one of the giants in the profession, having been, he was uh, named by uh, uh, Gerald Ford. Uh, remember him? Uh, some of you, probably, most of you probably weren't even born when uh, Gerald Ford was with us, uh, and then uh, elevated to the First Circuit by uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, former Chief Judge uh, full uh, of the uh, First Circuit as well. Uh, and uh, some two things that impress me especially uh, is that uh, Judge uh, Torioya is one of the uh, one of those circuit judges who, in, in addition to um, his, uh, his great uh, scholarship on the bench has been uh, uh, a major contributor to thought about uh, one of the fundamental questions in constitutional law, one of the really difficult questions, what he's going to be talking about uh, today, which is the um, constitutional treatment of uh, these uh, odd territories like uh, Puerto Rico that don't fit into the original constitutional scheme. But also, and this is the fact not everyone knows about the judge, is that he is a four-time, I believe it is, four-time Olympic uh, a competitor uh, in, uh, in sailing from, uh, from uh, Puerto Rico, making him, I think, one of only two federal court of appeals judges who have competed in the, uh, uh, in the Olympics. So uh, uh, with that, um, Judge, judge Torrier, welcome to, uh, to Stanford. Thank you so much for that kind of intro introduction. I wish you hadn't pointed the fact that Ford uh, pointed at me because it kind of dates me a little bit. But I guess that's obvious, so I can't hide from that. Uh, the one, uh, I suppose, attribute you didn't uh, uh, get, uh, state uh, is the fact that I am uh, a stamp collector. Uh, and this may sound like uh, 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 something that's not relevant to today's uh, discussion, but it so happened that at Christmas time I got a card with a stamp that I hadn't seen before, or, although, although apparently it's been around. And it's, it's a, a, a small stamp, uh, blue, with an American flag, and at the bottom it says in bold letters, equality forever. And I said to myself, maybe the post office is not so far off base as some people say it is. I will certainly not complain about the, the, uh, the post office as much as I usually do because I wish that were the case. And that certainly is apropos to today's discussion. Uh, but before I go any further, I, I'd like to thank uh, all of you who have been responsible for my being here today, which has not been totally easy because my house was buried under uh, snow and et cetera. I had no electricity, but I was able to, to make it. And I'm very happy to be here in California. It's just as beautiful as ever. And, and, and you certainly can't complain about this campus. Um, I had a written speech, but I rather than, than read from it, I'm going to try to uh, uh, talk about the, the main points that, that, that I have in it. Uh, and I will be speaking mostly about Puerto Rico because that's the subject that I know the best and the one that I've studied the most. But 
basically what I'd be saying here today is equally applicable to uh, all of the uh, territories and possessions of the United States. Uh, I, I'm sure that some people are offended or they dislike in some respect my, the title of my, of my uh, uh, remarks today because, first of all, uh, Americans don't think that they are a colonial power. I mean, that's the last thing that most Americans think. And, and a lot of them uh, would be, like I say, offended if I, uh, if I would say that we are. But the fact of the matter, we have certain jurisdictions that I will show to you that we may not call them colonies, uh, but uh, I think that they are de facto and de jure what is normally considered as a colony. And I would start by recalling what Shakespeare said in uh, Romeo and Juliet. I'm sure you all heard it. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name was malice sweet. Well, it's very relevant to what we're talking about today because what that uh, short sentence says is that you've got to look behind the title to really understand what the subject is. And uh, it is worth keeping in mind uh, during the course of today's this, uh, discussion. Personally, I would paraphrase Shakespeare by saying that that which we call a territory smells like a colony. And I would add under my breath that this is an odor that to me is anything but sweet. <laughs> uh, my comments today will be divided in, in, in two parts. First, I will explain to you why I believe that the relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico is a colonial one. And second, I will then argue that this relationship is unsupported by the Constitution and is contrary to international treaties to which the United States is a party, and, and these treaties have been uh, approved by the Senate and are therefore the law of the land. Uh, I suppose we should start by a definition uh, of what is a colony. Uh, it's a nebulous uh, definition. It's a nebulous uh, 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 name, uh, but uh, we, we, we always find a dictionary. I found uh, a dictionary that is approved by UNESCO, uh, and it's called the Dictionary of the Social Sciences. I think it's, it's as good a definition as any, anyone. Colonialism is defined as a state of inferiority or of servitude experienced by a community or a country or a nation which is dominated politically and or economically and or culturally by another more developed community or nation. And, and, and a colony is defined as a territory subordinate in various ways, political, cultural, or economic to a more developed country. Supreme legislative power and much of the administration rests on the controlling country. Uh, I'll show you why uh, Puerto Rico's relationship with the United States uh, fits into those uh, uh, definitions. Starting with uh, the political manifestations what we have is not an issue of subordination of Puerto Rico's political power versus the United States. What we have is no power on behalf of the Puerto Rico versus the United States. It's a one-sided relationship. And, I, and we, when we go into a, a further explanation as how this came about, this came about because of a series of cases I'm sure you've never heard of, uh, or if you have very lightly, because at least in law schools they don't seem to go into this subject very much. I, I hope maybe Stanford is different. I'm sure none of you, or most of you, have not heard of what's called the insular cases. Insular cases are a series of, of, of cases from the Supreme Court of the turn of the 19th century, 1901, uh, uh, dealing with the status of, of all the possessions territories that were acquired by the United States as a result of the Spanish-American War. 
We won't go into this at this point, but Congress has absolute power over Puerto Rico. And those cases hold that Congress's power under the territorial clause is plenary. Now, you may, the, the mean, that what that means, well, first of all, as a result of the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States, Puerto Rico has no political representation in Congress other than one so-called resident commissioner who has no vote in Congress. He has a right to sit there. Uh, at times, he's a, he has a right to speak, but he has no right to vote on any legislation uh, at all. That means that all the most important laws that apply to Puerto Rico are applied unilaterally, in which Puerto Rico has absolutely nothing to say about. So I think that pretty well falls in, into a category of the, 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 the political uh, power rests in one of the two parties. Uh, furthermore, uh, 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 the residents of Puerto Rico, even though they are United States citizens since 1917, a fact that is not realized by many people, we, in five years we will, we will be uh, celebrating our 100th anniversary as citizens of the United States. We have no right to vote for a, a representative in Congress or voting representative in Congress, I should say, and we have no right to vote for either president or vice president. The combination of these two things not only means that we have nothing to say about the laws, it also means we have nothing or very little to say about the administration of the laws because uh, the executive power of the United States basically uh, will sometimes listen to us but they, there's no, uh, uh, they, we, have, we have no political uh, pl clout in Congress. We cannot go to our congressmen and say, the uh, FAA is not doing this or this other agency is not doing that because there's no political power as the states have. That's a big difference. The states not only have the right to elect uh, the, the president and vice president, they also have voting congressmen which are able to exercise uh, 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 Power, oh, not power, but uh, uh, per, very persuasive uh, 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 on the administrative agencies. And, and I would like to point out at this point that in, in, in 19, 1899, uh, actually since 1812, when, when we were an out and out colony of, 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 uh, of Spain, Puerto Rico not only had full Spanish citizenship, we also had 14 delegates in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the parliament of Spain, it, it, uh, a fact that was shown because we were, uh, a, 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 the first vice president of the Spanish parliament was from Puerto Rico, Ramon Power. So all of this uh, was actually not in place, not totally in place at the time of, of the Spanish-American uh, Spanish War because they had been suspended because of the war in Cuba and afraid that it would uh, carry on to Puerto Rico. But at least uh, in theory, uh, and partially in practice, we had all these political rights which we have not had ever since. Uh, now, uh, the situation with economics is a little more complicated. Uh, And I have to read a little bit of statistics, which I know are boring, but they are necessary to make my point. First, I will read the good part. The good part is that we receive, Puerto Rico receives approximately $5.3 billion annually from U.S. government, governmental assistance. But we pay no federal income tax for income derived from Puerto Rico. I'm sure that all of you would like that. Uh, I've heard a lot of states, they say they're willing to change places with us. Uh, at least they say so. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so that's the good part. Uh, you know, I, I should have probably started by saying, we, uh, we are, the, the, the colonial uh, situation as far as the United States, uh, the uh, United States is a benign colonial power. It's not like other powers who are totally abusive, but uh, we, we have this situation that I think has to be corrected. On the other hand, the other side of the coin, and here comes the bad side. The United States 
controls 90% of our exports. 90% of our exports are destined to the mainland United States. Puerto Rico's principal industries almost are totally owned by U.S.-based multinationals. They have an annual net profit derived from Puerto Rico's activities of over $14 billion, which represents the highest return received by U.S.-owned companies anywhere. There are 110 Fortune 500 companies with, uh, with uh, operations in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a country in Latin America, assuming you consider us Latin America, in which U.S. companies have the highest direct investment. And partially, this is because Puerto Rican workers have a very high productivity rates, some of the highest in the world. To go back a little back uh, before these companies came to Puerto Rico, which really started around the, the 1950s, sugar was our main industry. Between 1900 and 1950, sugar was king in Puerto Rico. But these companies then, they were almost all American uh, uh, companies from, uh, I, I should say from Massachusetts. Massachusetts Trust controls three of the biggest uh, sugar and trials in Puerto Rico. <coughs> the Jones Act forces uh, all ships that, that carry cargo from and to Puerto Rico to use uh, U.S. Uh, flag ships, uh, uh, and even though we are one, only 1% 1 of the U.S. population, uh, we represent 30% of cargo carried on U.S. bottoms. The cost of doing this means that the transportation costs to and from Puerto Rico are higher uh, than they normally would be we could carry in foreign uh, bottoms. The result is that our uh, uh, at the consumer level, you're paying 25%, almost 25% higher prices than we would be otherwise. And uh, when you add to this that Puerto Rico is the highest importer of goods of the United States in the world, listen to that, uh, you, you know that we have a problem. Notwithstanding the economic prosperity that I have pointed to of, 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 of U.S. companies in Puerto Rico, unemployment rates are rarely below 11% and sometimes as high as 20%. The poverty level by U.S. standards is steadily at about 60%. <coughs> this has forced a large number of Puerto Ricans to move to the mainland. We have almost as many, there are four, almost 4 million people living in Puerto Rico and there's almost that many living in the United States spread throughout every state. Uh, and ironically, as you will hear from me in a few minutes when we get to the legal part, the, uh, the, these, these, once they move to the United States proper because they are U.S. citizens, they are entitled to all the rights that they do not have in Puerto Rico. The high unemployment rate has had a, another side effect. Puerto Ricans have joined uh, the U.S. armed forces in large numbers. Uh, and they have served in every uh, conflict, starting with the F uh, First World War up to the present conflicts. Uh, and the proportion of uh, casualties has been very high. Uh, we were the second highest uh, U.S. jurisdiction uh, to, in, in casualties uh, during uh, this proportionally, of course, in the, in the Korean conflict, and we were 14th in Vietnam. Uh, so. Uh, this has not been a, a, a happy picture in, in some in some senses. Although that's a way that uh, Puerto Ricans, many Puerto Ricans, have chosen to to, to get around the unemployment uh, problems. United States' original interest in Puerto Rico uh, was mainly strategic. As a matter of fact, Puerto Rico was, was invaded uh, in July of 1898, when the, almost when the Spanish-American War was over. This was an afterthought. Uh, this was not uh, originally planned. Uh, but the reason was for strategic reasons. By acquiring Puerto Rico, uh, uh, the, uh, the United States was already in Cuba, although obviously they weren't going to stay there. They intended to have some kind of a military presence, which became Guantanamo. Uh, Puerto Rico would take care of the Eastern Caribbean uh, as, as, as a naval base.
base in Collingport. <coughs> and both of these bases became uh, 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 crucial for protection of the Panama Canal and, and the approaches to the southern United States. So uh, basically, the, 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 the Caribbean became uh, an American lake. Uh, but Puerto Rico, between that time and the two world wars, uh, and uh, Korea, and even up to Vietnam, uh, uh, became a, a militarized uh, area. Uh, uh, Roosevelt Roads on the eastern end of, of Puerto Rico was the largest uh, naval base outside of continental United States. And its two offshore islands, Culebra and Vieques, uh, which were civilian inhabited, by the way, uh, half of the islands were, were, or a large part of the islands uh, had a population of civilians, became uh, uh, places to land uh, uh, the Marines uh, and engage in air and naval bombardment, particularly on the eastern part of Vieques. This took place for almost 60 years, uh, notwithstanding uh, decades of uh, opposition by successive local governments. We goes to show you what a lack of political power there. Uh, when the Navy finally discontinued bombing uh, several years ago, in 1999 to be exact, uh, it engaged in what I consider retaliation against the uh, population uh, by closing outright all, all of the bases uh, and uh, causing a major economic uh, disruption uh, to the Puerto Rican economy. That in itself is not as bad, in my opinion, as what happened next. The, the, the government has refused uh, and has stonewalled every, every effort uh, to clean up the environmental and ecological uh, damages that wrought upon particularly Vieques uh, and most of its 9,000 uh, civilian. Uh, and, uh, not, and this is notwithstanding what I have seen to be compelling uh, evidence that uh, uh, they, they have caused serious damage to the population. And, uh, and I'm sorry to say that, that uh, this has been backed up not only by the Congress, but also by the courts. Had Puerto Rico had the clout that California, Massachusetts, or Hawaii would have similar problems, this would not have been the outcome. The last area before I go into the legal is cultural manifestations. It's a very difficult subject because uh, we could say that America's colonial uh, cultural influence is worldwide. I mean, you have McDonald's in Paris and, and, and in China. Uh, you have music, uh, rock music everywhere. Oh, I mean, our, our cultural influences throughout the world. But it is different in the case of Puerto Rico, or at least in addition to that, because there's no, no, no doubt that those uh, uh, influences are there. Uh, but it is a complex issue. But uh, I can only read to you what has been said. Well, before that, the factors of inequality that I have pointed out uh, that Puerto Ricans have always suffered from deep ambivalence and insecurity when it comes to something as basic as who we are. And that's really at the bottom of what I'm talking about today. Who are we? Several studies have shown that Puerto Ricans suffer from a race of mental and personality disorders. Maybe I'm a, uh, one of the prime subjects. Uh, three times that of the United States average with schizophrenia being the most treated psychosis. In a paper presented to the American Academy of Psychoanalysis by Dr. Hector Beard, he said, the present state of Puerto Rican society is one of identity diffusion and identity confusion. Numerous social indicators reflect the depth and breadth of the Puerto Rican crisis and suggest a collectivity in a state of psycho psychological disintegration. Criminality is rampant. Divorce rates are among the highest in the world, as are the rates of alcoholism and drug abuse and the high incidence of psychopathology and emotional malfunction. We do not mean to imply that identity conflicts are the sole explanation 
for all Puerto Rico's social ills. Such a highly complex situation is evidently multi-determined and a host of other factors contribute, such as overpopulation, the stress of repeated uprootings in the pattern of back and forth migration, rapid social change, and so forth. But many of these factors are directly or indirectly related to the colonial status and the absence of mutually supportive psychosocial equ equilibrium to which identity conflicts contribute. I think that the facts that I have stated support an argument that there exists a colonial relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico. The next question, and probably the questions you're really interested in is, is there anything in the Constitution that supports a colonial relationship between Puerto Rico and any of its dependencies? I will argue that not only is there nothing in the Constitution to support it, and I will, of course, have to battle these insular cases and tell you why I think they're wrong and why they should be reversed. But I will also tell you that the United States has entered into uh, at least five international treaties, one of which ex ex especially controls this situation and which United States Senate uh, ratified, but which the courts have refused uh, in one way or the other to uh, comply with the law of the land. I have searched the Constitution from one end to the other, I'm sure you have also, for the word colonial. I haven't found anywhere, colony, I haven't found anywhere. I have searched the Federalist Papers from one end to the other. And I find the word colony not used or colonialism anywhere in those papers. I have found, and, and that's quite understandable. I mean, all of this took place, the, 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 the Constitution and, and all that came before. It came right at the end of a war of independence to beat down a colonial empire. So I, it would be very strange for the people who have broken those uh, chains to go around and say, well, okay, we're going to engage in that kind of, kind of conduct from then on. Now, there is, of course, in the Constitution, a clause which we refer to as the territorial clause. And that is very briefly discussed in the Federalist Papers. But as you will see, hear from me when I uh, go to the Lungborough case, which the Supreme Court totally ignored, refused to even mention in the uh, insular cases, uh, Chief Justice Marshall said, no, I take it back, that wasn't in, that was in the other case, a case that no one likes to talk about because it has other implications, which, which is this, uh, uh, the, the Scott case. Uh, the, the Supreme Court said that the territorial clause was specifically intended to deal only with the territories that existed at that time, and with, which were in dispute, actually, with, with Great Britain at that point, which were the Northwest Territories, for which an ordinance was passed thereafter, and that's what uh, converted them eventually into states. Now, there is a history of how the United States expanded from the original 13 colonies all the way to this state. And every time we expanded, the territories that we, 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 uh, we took over, we, it, they were administered temporarily as a territory with the intention of them, of them becoming a state. The last of uh, this progression was after the, uh, the Mexican War of 1848, when the uh, United States acquired most of the West, uh, California, all the way down to uh, 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 Arizona and uh, New Mexico, I believe. Just before that, the last expansion had been 
uh, the acquisition, I believe, of, of Texas, which, which had been a republic. But all of that had a progression and a historical sequence as to how we operated when we acquired territories. And that was in keeping with what uh, is discussed in the insular cases by, by the dissent. Now, the, the insular cases are about five or six different cases, all decided in 1901. There are several interesting things about these cases. First of all, uh, the issues always, the issue was, did the Constitution follow the flag? In other words, when we went somewhere uh, that was not a part of the original states, did the full Constitution apply to, to the actions by the, by, the, by the government? Those cases, the original cases, interestingly enough, are five, all five, four decisions. And they usually involve Downs v. Uh, uh, Bidwell, particularly, uh, either taxing issues or questions of customs. Uh, the Supreme Court that decides them is the same, except for one judge, the same court that de decided uh, the Plessy case involving equal, separate or equal. I find that rather, rather interesting because I think these are a continuum of that, of that, that situation. And in fact, a famous a writer, try to look, uh, well, I can't find it right now, but I'll find it. A, a, a famous writer tells us that what, what the Supreme Court uh, did uh, was basically apply uh, to the uh, newly acquired territories what we had applied to the Negro in the South of the United States after the, after the after the Civil War, and if you when you read these opinions, you will you'll ser there's certainly a tinge of racism involved through through these through these cases. This formula for ruling these uh, new acquired, newly acquired territories was against the historic uh, uh, background that I have just told you as to what we did with acquired territories. It was a theory concocted out of, of, of thin air by a Supreme Court, but not totally because there were several articles in the Harvard Law Review and the Yale Law Review which had uh, promoted these theories which they had taken from American, from uh, English colonial policy. Here it is. Reuben Francis Weston, in his book, Racism in U.S. Imperialism, says, the racism which caused the relegation of the Negro to a status of inferiority was applied to the possessions of the United States. That's his view. The leading case is Brown Downs versus Bidwell, in which the issue was whether the uniformity clause of the Constitution prohibited a non-uniform tax to be imposed to fund the expenses of the government of Puerto Rico. And thus, the question became, does the Constitution apply to Puerto Rico? It's exact same issue. Exact same issue. It come before the Supreme Court in Longborough v. Blake, authored by Chief Marshall, uh, Marshall in, in 1820. The issue in that case was whether Congress could impose a direct tax on just the District of Columbia. And the answer depended, again, on whether the Constitution and its uniformity clause applied to the District of Columbia, which, as you know, is also a territory. This was answered in a straightforward way by Chief Justice Marshall, in which he asks, the District of Columbia, or territory west of the Missouri, is not less within the United States than Maryland or Pennsylvania, and thus the Constitution applies. Not even a mention of this case in the insular cases. The second case is notorious for other reasons, and that's why it's hardly ever mentioned. Scott v. Stanford, known as the Dred Scott case, in which the question that came before the Supreme Court was whether an act of Congress prohibiting slavery in the territory of Missouri was a proper exercise of the power of, the, uh, uh, of Congress under the territorial clause of the Constitution. 
The decision is that Congress lacked such authority. And Chief Justice Taney said, quote, the territorial clause was intended to be confined to the territory which at the time of independence from Great Britain belonged to or was claimed by the United States, the Northwest Territory, which I have referred to, and can have no influence upon a territory once acquired from a foreign government. He goes on to say, there is certainly no power given by the Constitution to the federal government to establish or maintain co uh, colonies bordering on the United States or at a distance to be ruled and governed at its own pleasure, nor to enlarge its territorial limits in any way except by a mission of new states. No power is given to acquire territory to be held and governed in a permanently colonial character. But the Supreme Court chose not to read those cases and held a new theory of incorporation. According to this theory, the court looked at the Treaty of Acquisition. In Puerto Rico's case, it was the Treaty of Paris, as setting the underlying requirements of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the conquered territories and its inhabitants. Under Article 9 of the Treaty of Paris, Quote, the civil rights of the native inhabitants of the territories shall be determined by Congress. Now, if you stop a minute and think about this, what this means, particularly in view of the uh, cases that were never reversed, they're still in the books today, the court was holding that a treaty trumped the Constitution. The, 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 the Supreme Court held that under the, the territorial clause, Congress had plenary powers over the territories, except in such fundamental rights that they cannot be transgressed, whatever that meant. As you will see, the, there was not much they could transgress. So going back to the... Uh, Insert case, Downs v. Bidwell, the same issue, and they held they could do it. And uh, to the majority, uh, what, the leading dissent was by Chief Justice Fuller, who states uh, the the, 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 th that's the, the, the contention seems to be that if an organized and settled province of another sovereign is acquired by the United States, Congress has power to keep it like a disemboweled shade in an intermediate state of ambiguous existence for an indefinite period. And more than that, that after it is called, it, it, it has called it from limbo, it, has, it is absolutely subject to the will of Congress irrespective of constitutional provisions. That theory assumes that the Constitution crested a government empire to acquire countries throughout the world to be governed by different rules than those obtaining in the original states and territories, and substitute for the present system of republican government a system of domination over distant provinces in the exercise of unrestricted powers. Justice Harlan's dissent is even better, but I, 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 I'm, I'm Probably, I don't know how long I've been speaking. I, I hope somebody gets bored and tells me to stop. You can do it. <laughs> uh, what we have next are two cases, one from Hawaii and one from Alaska. Hawaii v. Manchinki and Rasmussen v. United States. Both criminal cases, both involving uh, whether a jury was, uh, uh, they were entitled to a uh, a jury and uh, in, indictment by a grand jury, etc. Uh, in both cases, in Hawaii, the Hawaiians have been given citizenship before these cases, because these cases uh, are 1903 and 1905, and the same thing with Alaska. The Supreme Court holds, well, now these people are citizens, therefore they're, they're entitled to all these rights. 
Wow, great. That's the key. If we get citizenship, then we're entitled to these rights. Well, think again. In 1917, the Jones Act gives uh, the residents of Puerto Rico U.S. citizens. So we are now U.S. citizens. And along comes People versus Balzac. An interesting case because none of the things that happened there would seem to be applicable today, but they are. Balzac was a small town uh, editor of a, a newspaper uh, who, who was charged with criminal libel. I don't think that even exists today charged with criminal libel of the governor of Puerto Rico, which probably wasn't very hard to do. So he gets charged with this. He says, whoa, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a U.S. citizen now. I, I am entitled to have a jury uh, indict me, uh, a, a grand jury indict me, and a, and a petite jury try me. The Supreme Court of Puerto Rico said, no, uh, no you're not entitled to that. So he appeals to the Supreme Court, and, and, and the Supreme Court rules nine zip in an opinion by Chief Justice Taft, with whom I will talk in a few minutes, that he was not entitled to that. Now, I have to talk about Chief Justice Taft, or I will explode. <laughs> now, Chief Justice Taft, apart from weighing two, uh, 300 pounds, as you know, had been President of the United States. But before that, he had been uh, uh, a colonial advocate in many ways. He was the first colonial government of the Philippines in the middle of the Philippine insurrection, which lasted from 1901 to 1903, and in which the US Army lost more troops than during the entire Spanish-American War. So he had no great love for, for, uh, for, the, for, for the colony. In addition to that, he had also been temporary governor of Cuba under uh, the Platt Amendment, which allowed, which allowed the United States to take over Cuba, basically, for almost any condition. In addition to that, he was president of the United States, and he had a famous, well, famous in Puerto Rico anyway, a famous interchange with the Puerto Rican legislature in 1901 because the Puerto Rican legislature objected to something that was being done by the federal government. And he went, uh, 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 he was very upset. And he said that Puerto Ricans had more rights than they were entitled to, and more rights than they were, they were good for them, and so on and so forth. So he, he had a certain amount of, of dislike for, for the Puerto Rican population. He shows it, in my opinion, in this case. He holds that all that U.S. citizenship granted to the Puerto Ricans was the right to come to the United States without going through immigration. And once they were established in this country, they were entitled to all the rights of US citizens. I, I, I'm going to give you a personal an anecdote about this. Uh, how absurd, in my opinion, this, this, this rule is. I am a US Court of Appeals judge. I sit on the First Circuit. But my residence, I was born in Puerto Rico, my residence in Puerto Rico, but I travel once a month to Boston to hear cases, some of which are of national importance and have national import. I can vote on my court, but I, I, next time I take a plane back, which will be tomorrow, I, I, I lose my right to vote for president or, uh, or to have representatives in Congress. To me, apart from the legal issues, I, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, 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 but that is, if you, have, if you think that Balzac is not the law, read some of the Guantanamo cases, because they're cited in there, and it's still the law today. The, the other thing that I wish to point out before I, I close is how uneven and it shows you the discriminatory, discriminatory manner in which these cases have been applied and how uneven the Supreme Court has applied them. In the, uh, uh, at the end of the Second World War, uh, two uh, uh, wives that accompanied uh, their husbands who were servicemen, one to England and the other one to the Jap Japan, uh, got tired of getting beat up by their husbands and killed them. And uh, according to the uh, Court of Military Justice in existence at that time, they were uh, charged with murder and tried before a court martial and found guilty. Well, 
They then uh, were transported to the United States for, to serve their life sentences in military prison. And they both brought habeas corpus petitions. And the Supreme Court, uh, when it first came to them, uh, found that the issue of cases applied, that they were not entitled to, to either a jury trial or a grand jury trial, and uh, uh, sustained the conviction. There was such a hue and cry in the public and in the law reviews over the summer that the Supreme Court, I think, uh, decided uh, to give a rehearing. And a rehearing was granted towards the end of the summer. At that point, Justice Brennan had already come on the court. And the cases were reversed. I'll read just the, uh, those from there. The polarity of opinion that was written by Black and joined by Douglas and the Chief Justice of Brennan is a reminiscence of the dissent in the original insular cases. At the beginning, we reject the idea that when the United States acts against citizens abroad, it can do so freely of the Bill of Rights. By the way, if you haven't noticed, this is an issue that's right here now with us with the drones. I don't know how it'll come out, and furthermore, I don't even know what I, how I would vote it. It's a very complicated issue, but it is, it, this is not ancient history. Its power and authority have no other source than the Constitution. It can only act in accordance with the limitations imposed by the Constitution. While it has been suggested that only those constitutional rights which are fundamental protect Americans abroad, we can find no warrant in logic or otherwise for picking and choosing among the remarkable collections of thou shall not, which explicitly fasten upon all departments and agencies of the federal government by the Constitution and its amendment. Furthermore, in view of our heritage and history of the adoption of the Constitution and its amendments, it seems particularly anomalous to say that trial before a civilian judge by an independent jury picked from the common citizenry is not a fundamental right. Exactly the opposite of what Taft said, of course, and, 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 and the Supreme Court has said nowadays in other cases. But there's one last point, and that is international law. I know that that's not a very popular subject in many places, but I think it's in the Constitution. Of course, I might add that, that, that uh, everybody thought that Reed, Reed and Covert would, would, would uh, put an end to the insular cases, but they, they, they didn't go any further. And it shows you a different, same, almost the same uh, kind of uh, issues and they apply it in one way to one set of, of, of uh, defendants in a, a different way to what others say. There are five international treaties. I can find them. There are five, I'm, I'm just going to live it. Uh, therefore, I can retract anything I say later. <laughs> there are five international treaties uh, involving uh, civil rights. The most important, in my opinion, and the most uh, the clearest uh, and on point is the, the latest, the la latter one, which is the International Covenant of uh, Civil and Something Rights. Uh, this has come up before several courts, including mine, uh, and, and, and it involves, it specifically grants the uh, states that every country as a signatory shall make every effort uh, to grant equal rights uh, and, and, and voting rights in, in very specific form. There's nothing general about this, this statute uh, to the citizens of the, of the countries that have signed it. Uh, up to now, every court has seen it, including mine, has refused to uh, uh, enforce it 
uh, under the theory that th these are not self-executing uh, treaties, and that the, and that the Senate, in ratifying, engaged in some declaration saying that certain sections were not uh, applicable. In my opinion, uh, this is an erroneous thinking for several reasons. In the first place, uh, the Senate, under the Constitution, can approve or disapprove a treaty. Everything else it says, or it can make reservations. In this case, we don't have reservations. There's a difference between a reservation and declaration in international law. In a reservation, the Senate says, we approve, or we, we want to approve this unless this is changed. And then the United States has to go back and renegotiate that part. In a declaration, all that, all that, all that, that is happening is that the Senate is giving its interpretation to what it thinks the, 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 the approved language means. It has no substantive, it is legislative history, but it has no substantive effect. Because otherwise, well, you would be happy. Since, since a treaty becomes the law of the land, if the Senate could do this unilaterally, in effect, what you would be having is the Senate legislating without the House participating. And it can only do so in approving a, a, uh, the, the text of the treaty as it has been negotiated. Uh, I hope some of the international uh, scholars here will correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I am, but I could be at that point. Uh, I will close with a, with a statement that I think, I think we have, I think I have uh, uh, fairly established uh, that Puerto Rico, in its present status, and the other territories, we're talking about, about uh, four and a half million people here. We're not just talking about one or two people. Uh, in addition to Puerto Rico, uh, th these cases that I have referred to have created a, a, a colonial status in perpetuum. There's no limit on how long they're going to last, uh, uh, and, and, and only Congress can decide that. Uh, as I have stated, although this relationship is benign in many ways, it is clearly one of inequity in which the governed, the United States citizens who reside in Puerto Rico and other territories, are ruled without their democratic consent. Call it territory, unincorporated territory, Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, its official title in English, by the way, or Estado Libre Asociado, its official Spanish title. These are just names without substance. The real name of this relationship is, and should be, an anathema to the United States considering its history and our status in the world. I commence my remarks with a quote from Shakespeare about roses. Perhaps it's appropriate that I end it with an equally famous quote uh, by Gertrude Stein to the effect that a rose is a rose is a rose by exercising a degree of poetic license and intermingling Shakespeare and Stein and the subject of today's discussion by saying that a colony by any other name is still a colony, a colony, a colony. Thank you. If you want to subject me to some cross-examination, I'm here. Take, take, a, take a shot. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask how you think uh, the opportunity for uh, territory like Puerto Rico to apply for statehood would affect its uh, treatment under the Constitution if it has the potential ability to, I mean, not guarantee, but to apply to change its status. Does that change um, your, your view of the one-sided treatment or not? Um, you, you have a very good point. Uh, the fact is there has been for my office, and this is really a political issue, not a political question, a political issue, because uh, it is Congress that has to grant statehood. Uh, but Congress has not 
of showing itself in any way uh, uh, amenable to setting up the what is required for, for this purpose. Uh, for, for example, Congress has never authorized a plebiscite on this issue. We've had local plebiscites, uh, some, some with, uh, I, I hate to say, with absurd results. One of them had four, question, four issues, and one of them was none of the above. And if you can believe me, none of the above is the one that won. <laughs> so, but part of it is because no one takes these too seriously, because they know they mean nothing. It is Congress that has the power. I go back to this. And unless Congress authorizes it, and of course the problem we have is, I mean, let's be realistic. I would, I would think that statehood for Puerto Rico right now, or any change in status, is the last thing that Congress, if you ask somebody in Congress about this, they, they'll look at you like you're crazy. They have other issues, and I can understand that. But there's, some, uh, there's, a, there's something added that just, came, that just happened in the election that took place in November in Puerto Rico. A majority of voters uh, voted in favor of statehood as, 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 as a change. Uh, whether this goes any further than just that, I don't know. Well, first of all, thank you very much for being here today and speaking with us. I'm curious whether you think it's your personal view that statehood would be an appropriate solution, or would you prefer um, some other solution, such as independence, or maybe some slight modification of the, of the status quo that, that was not statehood? Well, I, I'm going to answer that in two ways. I mean, emotionally and uh, philosophically, I believe in the American system. So I'm in favor of that for those reasons. But on a practical basis, who is independent today? Certainly none of the countries that surround us. I mean, you know, there's such thing as formal colonies and informal colonies. The world is populated with informal colonies of the United States, of Great Britain, of France. And there's just as much colonies. And the only chance that we have, in my opinion, of exercising some power over what happens uh, to, to Puerto Rico is by us being part of the people that make the decisions. I can tell you when I was chief judge, of the circuit, and I don't think I'm saying anything out of, out, out of line, whenever I needed to have something done by Washington, I called one of my colleagues uh, who had been the campaign manager for a senator, and that's how I got things done, because when I called, they were very polite, always, but nothing happened. Judge, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was that uh, most of the people of Puerto Rico are, were opposed to statehood because of the financial considerations that you talked about earlier, that aid to Puerto Rico by the United States would essentially stop, that an income tax would probably be imposed, and um, that, um, that that was one of the reasons why that some of these local uh, elections were voted down. And that Congress had, had essentially said if Puerto Rico really wants to be a state, that they have to ask us for statehood. Well, I have several answers for that question. First place, uh, I do not believe that most of the people in Puerto Rico are against statehood. At least part of the problem is how you present the, the problem. If you have four alternatives, you'll get none of the above or something as silly as that. What you need is a plebiscite in which the issue is squarely presented with constitutional formulas. If you put a uh, commonwealth uh, which has control of immigration, which ha can veto uh, federal laws, uh, a whole bunch of things that are constitutionally impossible, in my opinion, of course they'll vote for that. You'll have almost any state willing to secede if they got something like that. But if you put a, a, to, the, to, the, to the people of Puerto Rico that by Congress, because they know that the end, and, and with a agreement by Congress, they will then act upon whatever comes out. If you put the two constitutional alternatives, independence or statehood, I'm going to tell you that you'll get over 90% of people who vote for statehood. And today, the alternatives were 
the, 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 the alternatives at this last uh, uh, election were, are you, do you want the present status or, or do you want uh, uh, this, uh, uh, a, 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 um, a non-colonial status? The non-colonial status won by a large amount and then from there you voted in which kind of non-colonial status and, and, and I, I think it was 64% for statehood. Uh, the, the thing is that th there, is a, there is definitely a movement or a thought or undercurrent in Congress that they don't want to give us statehood. So they'll use almost any, uh, a, a, any excuse, including that they want a supermajority, uh, a whole bunch of things that have never been requested from any other state, I don't think, uh, that I'm aware of. You, there was something more that you asked that I left it out. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> Oh, financial, because look, you can apply federal income tax today, okay? When you have 60% of the people living under the poverty level, do you think they are concerned with paying income tax? They're not paying, in fact, Puerto Rico income tax is higher than federal income tax. Now, there are obviously usually very wealthy people that don't want to pay federal income tax, but they're certainly the minority. Sorry. Judge, thank you for your talk today. I think you make a really persuasive case that the doctrine of territorial incorporation is born out of ideas about colonialism and racism at the time. But in your last response, you also mentioned the issue of secession. One historian who studied these cases has said that that has actually a large part to do with explaining this. You have a number of Civil War veterans on the court at the time. The country had just answered one major constitutional question about the indissolvability of the union. Is there some kind of strange benefit in the insular cases in allowing these different options? Because, of course, Puerto Rico isn't the only territory governed under this doctrine at the time. The Philippines, Hawaii, and, and these places go in different directions. The Philippines, an independent country today, Hawaii, a state. Puerto Rico remains a territory. Is there a kind of, um, you know, silver lining to these in a way that that it provides this political flexibility? Well, there, there is a one uh, uh, constitutional scholar who I respect quite a bit. Uh, she teaches at Columbia University, I can't remember her name, whose theory is, yes, whose theory is that uh, one of the reasons why it was decided that way was that so that the United States could grant independence to Puerto Rico without being bound by non-secession. I, I, Respect her. Uh, I can't argue with her because, but I have seen nothing that leads me to, to lead to that conclusion. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think you could argue that, that says, according to the Supreme Court, we are not incorporated into the United States. We're we're a part to it, but not a part of. It's, I think that's how the language goes. I suppose you could argue that. Uh, but what are you going to do with the 4 million uh, U.S. citizens who are going to refuse to, to give up their citizenship? And I think, I may be wrong, although <laughs> you never know, I don't think you can just take their citizenship away. No, but I know, but but the people, everyone who has been born in Puerto Rico since 1917, either because of the Jones Act or the Nationality Act of 1940, have become U.S. citizens. Okay. Can you take that citizenship away if you follow the Supreme Court cases? I mean, you know, <laughs> anything can happen in this area. But but if you if you believe that those cases are the law of the land. I don't see how you can take their citizenship away. The first thing that would happen is there would be such a, if, if, if there was even a rumor of that happening, half of the population would be moving up here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, obviously, there's a pretty persuasive case for Puerto Rico as a state in terms of infrastructure and population, and we still see that it's not politically possible. Congress would never allow it to happen. Uh, what do we make of other territories who would be getting a full congressional delegation, three electoral votes, and in the case of 
you know, Guam, the Northern Marianas, they have very small populations. So it seems like politically statehood would never be possible. But clearly independence would just Island. evolve into the form. Why would it? it would not? How, how big is Rhode Island? Do you think Rhode Island is much bigger than Guam? I, it probably has an order of magnitude more people, at least. I mean, we well, would be... Uh, Guam is about to become a, um, a, a, the biggest marine base in the world. Uh, so they're going to have a lot of people there. I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you, but I think if we can't uh, if we can't expect statehood for Puerto Rico because of the political difficulty, to give statehood to a, a territory of 50,000 people seems especially unlikely. But if they were to become independent, it would devolve into the form of de dependent independence that you speculated for all these Caribbean nations or everywhere else. So what... You know, what what the population, you know what the population of uh, Arizona and New Mexico were when they became a state? Just Very around 50,000. In fact, as I recall, and I may be wrong on this, and please correct me if anyone knows it. If I recall, that was more or less the, the, the limit that they required before they, they would grant state of 50,000. You, know, you know, this is not an easy, believe me, this is not, there are a lot of authority issues, but at the, at the bottom of everything is that you have four million U.S. citizens who are not full citizens unless they move away from their homes. Thank you for listening to me and uh, for your uh, interesting questions, unless you have anything more. Huh? Oh, I'll take them all afternoon. I have nothing else. <laughs> Well, thank you for your very interesting talk, Judge. Uh, just a question, you seem to identify two different aspects of the sort of legal colonialism. One is the absence of representation in the federal government, and the other is the kind of incomplete application of the Constitution in, you know, jury rights, for example. And I wonder if there isn't kind of, you couldn't see the second one as a sort of trade-off for the first one. So if a place isn't gonna get representation in the federal government, um, then maybe it makes sense to give it some more flexibility in how it organizes its courts and things like that. So it shouldn't have to, if it, the U.S. isn't going to commit to making it a state, then maybe it should get to have more flexibility in its own affairs than a state would. Well, that's a good point, uh, because uh, the cases that I have participated in uh, have come up on the issue of, of voting rights for people in Puerto Rico have been based on a literal reading of the Constitution, the question that you have to have electoral votes, et cetera. And in the case of president and vice president, uh, and, and because the Constitution speaks about state, uh, uh, one, a circuit judge from uh, uh, New York, Pierre Laval, uh, came up with a concurring opinion in one of his cases on this subject, we, we said, uh, as, it, as, it has, as it's done, I don't know if it's applicable, but certainly it's something to think about. As you know, the, in the, the Armed Services Act permits overseas uh, uh, soldiers and sailors and what have you to vote, uh, even though they are overseas based on the state from which they come from. Uh, and he, he says that maybe something could be done like that by attaching in some way the voters from Puerto Rico to the electoral voters of, or, or, the, or, or the political system of some state to allow them to engage in voting. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> well, Justin, thank you very much for joining us. It's, it's been a pleasure having you, and, and we hope to have you again maybe next year. <laughs> you have a great school. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>